You've been out too long in the midnight sea. Oh, what's becoming of me? Bow, bow. Ride the tiger. You can see his eyes, but you know he's clean. Oh, what's becoming of me? Bow, bow. Holy Diver? I don't know what that is. Okay. What is it? <laughs> it's Holy Diver by Dio. Oh. Ronnie James. I never Dio. knew Dio, but I remember Dio as the T-shirt that we would always price the lowest out of all the metal tees because yes. it was the lamest yes. one. Yes, so there was a point like the in lamest time. Band. I guess we're going to the intro now. There was a point in time when – and I you, I know you worked at vintage clothing stores, and so I just observed – The only thing I'm trained to do. Exactly. Precisely. Is as a vintage. Only thing which I'm trained to do – Which is now called a curator, by the way, which I want to – Curator? Dec- I am cl- declaring jihad on the word curator. You, te- you tell me I those- worked at a place that tried to give me that title, and I said, no, thank you. You tell me those, no, thank those, you. those little chickadees at the Buffalo Exchange at the thing where you bring your laundry no. in? No, 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 no. Oh, not that. something else. Yeah. Like well, I'm talking about different. at Buffalo Exchange, Wasteland, all these kind of places. Mm. I would uh, – there would be – girls were wearing Iron Maiden shirts like crazy. Am I remembering that wrong? That Iron Maiden shirts – I would say that, yeah, that was like a thing in like from 2004 yeah. to like it really stopped being a thing in like – 2010? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would yeah. say like a crop top Iron Maiden shirt. Well, the, like $85. The, the crop top thing stopped in the early 2000s. And then it was like, I just want it to be the regular shirt. Because okay. if you started to alter it, it was like, now you look way, t- like you're trying way too hard. It's gotcha. corny. Yeah, you, never you have bad like tattoos. Yeah. You work at Pops. You drink PBR. That oh my God, true. your hair looks like shit. Why mm. are your teeth so fucked up? Is this still about a girl? This is about a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> Dong. Hello, practitioners. Breathe in. My name is Brace Bell. <laughs> I'm Liz. I want to say before I say, we are, of course, joined by Young Chomsky. This is true and Hello. That this gentleman sitting across from me, Brace Belden. Breathe out. We were at the food court in Chicago's beautiful Midway Airport. Breathe in. And Brace says to me, I think we should get a gong for the studio. Breathe out. And I was like, you know, I think... You know, Young Chomsky does a good job of just like putting that sound effect in. Not how you said it. Like, yes, it, yes, I did. Not like, how you we said could it. just put it in later; it'll sound better. And then I said, I don't like the idea; it's a little too drive time for me. So what drive actually? Time radio, like a guy being like, oh, bong. What actually happened? What actually happened? That is what happened. What actually happened is a friendly listener, who, by the way, I cherish all of you, um, sent me a link. Saying this is a gong, I work for this gong. Okay, I, you didn't say any of this context to me. Oh, well, because yeah, I was cut off. That is not true. almost as if someone hit a gong while I was talking. Oh my god, but, this is so not true. Uh, I found a gong. I found a gong with a smiley face on it. Why are they putting smiley faces on gong? Why would you because hit a smiley they face? They make people happy. What it should be because is you hit it, happy. and then it turns. It goes oh, and it turns oh! like it's like like you just hit it in the face. So and then now Liz that says, would be now that's some technology. Liz goes mm, no. She goes no. <laughs> like a no, like a mean no. She goes no, it was and I'm like, like too Howard Sterny or something it's, for me. Uh, okay, all right. First of all, I don't know if you've uh, a sound effect gong is not Howard Sterny to you. Second of all, Howard Stern is the king of all media, Mister Showbiz. I yeah, don't, but I am the queen of all media, and I don't. I'm not a gong that's hitter. Taylor Swift. That's Taylor Swift. But yeah, I. I'm. So you don't have to hit the gong. And by the way, I should mention this. I should mention this part that Liz left out. I said I'll pay for it with my own money. Which is weird. Why would you? What? Why? Why? Because what, how, I knew, how would that sweeten the deal? Because I knew I would face resistance from you. And but I it's was not right. about the cost of the gong. I'm just saying. So there's no skin off your back. It's no, my gong. But so, no, no, let me no. ask you this. Let me I ask you this. I think you should have the gong at home. Let me ask you this. If I did, I'm going to buy the gong for home. By the way, I was actually going to buy it's two gongs. It's a home gongs. gong. No, you, I don't have a gong. Is universal. You don't have a home gong or a work. Yeah, gong. you do. It's not like yeah. well, there is no work gong because there's like no underwear. gong in here. The well, gong is in the computer. The computer song sound can be the gong. Actually, Liz, I have both good news for me and bad news for you. The gong is in a package downstairs by the desk. 
Did you seriously buy a gong? I bought a gong, and I, you know what? I paid two hundred dollars for fast shipping. Oh my god! It weighs something in the vicinity of four hundred pounds. It's massive. Okay. Let us I, know in the. I did not actually do that, but let us know in the comments if we should get a gong. No, I have a feeling on. how this will turn out. Don't egg him on, you fucking people. Why were we in Midway, Liz? I have. Okay, so we're going to talk about Falun Gong. Obviously, this is part three. You clicked it. You're listening. You know what to expect. You know what's going to happen. You know what fucking time it is. You know what fucking time it is. But jokes on you suckers because it's not that time yet because it is now at this point in the podcast it is time for the airing of the grievances yeah we got some complaining to do i need to complain about some shit so we played a show in austin Mm -hmm. great show great show great crowd wonderful crowd time of our lives well we don't need to go that's not that's not yeah it was great it was a time time in our lives (laughs) now We flew into Austin. We got in there Friday night. Mm -hmm. Show was on Saturday. We're set to leave Sunday. Yeah. Young Chomsky here. He's smart as hell. He gets on an early flight. Yeah. Now, I prefer to fly into Newark Airport. Yes. And Liz, I will say this, just to make myself sound better. Liz was like intimating that one of us should fly with her. No, I wasn't. You were. No, no, no. That's what you thought? Am I wrong on this, Young Chomsky? No, I was saying, I was extending that because I knew you wanted to hang out in Austin with your buddies. So I was saying, why don't you stay with me longer because I can't take it. There were two flights to Newark on Sunday, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I was saying, there's no fucking way I'm taking a 6 a.m. flight after the show. So I'm taking the 6 p.m. Brace, if you would like to stay and hang out because I know you want to hang out with your friends, that would be a whole day. That's literally where it was coming from. I'm not, Stop looking at him. I, we are we are exchanging glances at each other. I'm I'll just say this. Not that is not exactly how I remember it. Okay. Happening. Stop recording for a second because I want to clear the air. Well, we've resolved that. And now we're back to the story. Mm. So we we are leaving at we're supposed to leave at something like 6 p.m., right? Yeah. The no, the flight was at 6:50. Yes. <laughs> Um, we get to the airport, we're chilling, we're mm-hmm. grooving, we're ready to go. We eat some of the worst hamburgers. Oh, so disgusting. Yeah. It was awful. And 15 minutes, I would say, before we were set to board. Can I mention something? Mm. Can I mention something? We had been bumped up. Oh, yeah. To first class. We did. We, we got did not upgraded. pay for that. They bumped us up there. Yeah. And I was... So exciting! I know it was really exciting. I, and yeah, we were we were like, and I and I said to Liz, we were eating these nasty gray hamburgers, and I said, you know what, this trip has been great. Everything's wor-. and I, I this is yeah, so this you is, did say this. I will say everything that happens from me saying that, I will take responsibility for, and it is my fault. <laughs> I said everything's worked out, and we're gonna fly first class home. I've flown first class one time in my life, another bump. And this one, I was like, maybe they'll have the nicer first class seats, because the last time it was just kind of a bigger regular seat. Mm-hmm. Newer plane, perhaps. Newer plane, newer plane. Perhaps. Well, there was no plane. It was no because plane. we got, or I got a text message, boop, right on my phone, fifteen minutes before we're set to board or whatever. That's like your flight has been canceled, and I was like, I'm sorry, what? What? What did it tweet while flying to Africa? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, this has never happened before. Yeah. So we hightail it out of the burger joint. We're running down. By the way, the Austin airport, long as hell. It's just a corridor. It's one long boy. It's a corridor. And so we're booking it, shuffling along. Um, there's a massive line at the ticket desk. And I'm yeah. like, oh my God, our flight really is canceled. It's really canceled. We're in line. We start overhearing people that are like, they can't get people on flights until Tuesday. Yes. It's Sunday, by the way. So I get on the old telephone, and I'm ring, ring, ringing up the airline. You should, you should hear her. I mean, I know I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but there's she's she fin, she can finesse anybody behind the desk. It's <laughs> insane. The guy was, you know, he was fine, but I'm like, can you get a? I go into like crazy, like, okay. I'm going to fix the situation. I can do whatever I can. I got my laptop open. I'm on the phone with the guy. I'm like, I will get us on a flight in Dallas, in Houston, in – I'll fucking go to Oklahoma. I'll figure it out, right? Get us to Philly. I don't care. Get we'll us fly to, to Philadelphia. Get, I, there's three plane, three airports, Newark, 
LaGuardia, JFK. Get me to one of them. Get us to D.C. You said D.C. We said D.C. was okay. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's actually kind of really hard to get. Pittsburgh would be like flying to Cleveland. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. (laughs) Yeah, that's not going to work. But the guy on the phone was like, I can't get you on anything until Tuesday morning. No flights to the tri-state area until Tuesday. 5.40, layover in Denver, Denver to, I think it was to New York, I think. And then as I'm like, all right, let's just get on that flight and let me see if I can get us on a different airline or whatever. Every airline is now, every flight is like changing. Yes. You're like watching the casino numbers. like Watch it go up. Watch it go up. On the fucking, what is it called? Phone. Oh, casino. Are you talking about slot machine? Yeah, there you go. It's like the slot machine numbers running. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like Delta, $1,200. Yeah. One way from Austin to JFK. No, uh, two thousand dollars from any. Of then places. there's just oh, no tickets. None. People None bought those. Monday. None Tuesday. We start hearing in the line. Oh, they're putting people on flight Wednesday. We're like, what the fuck is going on? Then, then, the stewards and stewardesses are leaving the, you know, the plane. They're deboarding. They're deplaning. There you go. Deplaning and. We hear them mumming, like, what's going on? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. They say Newark Airport got shut down. So we we had been told by the capo who was at the desk. No, she was nice. Well, oh, I'm sure many of them were as well. (laughs) But um, this this Sonder Commando in a skirt tells us that it's weather. No, they were nice. Uh, Tells us it was was weather. I know. I really feel bad throwing in it. entirely full can of Coke <laughs> overhand top speeded them the moment that you got the text message saying it was canceled. Thank God we paid all that money to get rid of that viral video. <laughs> exactly. So, you didn't get- <laughs> so uh, no, so they said, oh, it's weather. And I'm, you know, of course, trust but verify, but also don't trust them. I looked, the weather in, in New Jersey was completely clear. I do search uh, Newark Airport on uh, Twitter and raw news alerts says that a vibrating uh, piece of luggage uh, was left unclaimed for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, somewhere under an hour, and they cleared the airport for that. Uh, vibrating piece of luggage, listener, you sounds like you forgot your valise at the Newark airport. So I, I was like, uh, well, but then they reopened it. It was fine. So it's like a 30 minute, 45 minute thing that you know, and they cancel somehow all the flights. Uh, all of them. Yeah. All, all of them. them. All just all of them. All of them. So we get up to the desk, and again, the lady, I feel bad. She can't do anything. She's like, there's no flights. You're on this Tuesday flight. Meanwhile, I'm on the computer. I'm going. I'm going. I get us two tickets on the last Southwest flight. We go from Austin to Midway, Midway to LaGuardia. Yeah. And let me tell you, I would rather be at the famous battle that took place on the island of Midway for the rest of my life than spend another 10 minutes in that dump they call an airport. Yeah. Well, that was the only flight I could get us on on a Monday. Everything else. It was crazy. It was psychotic. But the women's like, oh, um, Brace, Brace is so good. He's like, what about vouchers? Like, how, where are we staying? Yeah. She's like, yeah. they keyed it as weather in the system, so I can't, I can't, I can't offer you, you anything. A voucher. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. She, I, yeah, it's either they. I, it was weather. I, I think she said, but she said that they keyed it in a way that they wouldn't be able to give us vouchers. Yeah, and she felt really bad. She was like apologizing. Yeah. I mean, there were people in line. You said there was like some someone who was like, I, I can't. I don't have childcare. Like, what am I supposed to do? There was a woman weeping next to me because they were telling her Thursday was the next flight they could get her on. She said, yeah, uh, and she did. She was like, you know, Brace, you can stay at my place, but mm. her, she can't. I was like, I, I gotta stay with Liz. Um, to protect her from bats. And mind you, every other flight you could buy, except for, I got the Southwest ones for less than this, but still very expensive, was like $1,100. Yeah. It was psycho. One way, it was psycho. So today, we are declaring fatwa against the airline industry writ large. I don't know why I say writ large all the time. Well, I'm Against just the like- airline industry. I really want to know. I mean, I know that people joke this would be our most boomer episode, which yes. makes me even want to like lean lean into it even more. But like, part of me really does want to investigate why is flying so fucking shitty? Yeah, like why at every step of the way that you do this, 
why it's so shit and not in some kind of like totally like rose emoji libtarded like well what's the deal regulating the airlines I get it of course but it's not just that there's so much like every step of the way some asshole is coming in and squeezing every single thing they can from everyone and it's not like flying is a luxury now man this is just transportation yeah I mean it's like it's I can't believe how expensive it is I can't believe how shitty it is I can't believe they make it. And it's shitty take it. for the fucking people who work for the airlines too. It's like the whole thing is a fucking shit show. So and I they, do kind of want to go full boomer and do an episode investigating why it is because I kind of want to know. I want to know as well. And I also – let me tell you this. The shoes stay on. I'm sorry. If I wear my shoes to bed like I do Naturally. in case there's a fire, yes. uh, I should be able to wear my shoes through a um, – yeah, metal detector. Dumbass well, they're Tevas. It's made out of fucking – And you can keep your shoes on. I don't – I can't get pre-check. Because of the thing? Because of the thing. Mm. Yeah. Because of the reason we have to wear the shoes in the first place. <laughs> check this out. Wait. Before you do the check this out thing, I just want to say this is so corny. I'm, I will never do this ever again in the history of podcasts. I will never do it again in the f- future of the podcast. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I do. Well. Do people want to hear the airplane episodes? Let me know. Yeah, okay, we're getting, little, we're getting a little, yeah, we never do really Maybe a temperature check like that. But I do want to do a little temperature check. Yeah. Sound off in the comments. Sound off in the comments. Speaking of flying, let's get our little tukishes on an airplane and head all the way to China. The year is 1999, and it's the end of our last episode. And we're talking about, you know, oh... This sort of build up, this Qigong fever. Everyone's going crazy, doing all these fucking moves in the parks in China. <laughs> People are doing ESP. The government's like, we love this shit. It's kind of like healthcare. Like it's just maybe a little different than what you might think of as biomedicine or whatever. Everyone's fits fire. Yeah, everyone's- you see footage from China, nineteen ninety nine, and you're like, damn, that's a fucking vibe. Yeah, they they Looks all cool look. They all look like very cool. Uh, they, uh, you know, I'm not like someone who could do this. Young I, Chomsky's googling. I, right I would now. look like a kind of like a baby. But you know how like a lot of adult men in their 20s kind of dress like little kids in the 90s? Mm. They're a lot of like they, Oshkosh Bagosh. Obviously, they didn't, weren't doing Oshkosh Bagosh in China. Sure. But fanny packs, et cetera. Mm. Um, unfortunately, the Chinese government did, says this is uh, hooey. This they actually, ban it. This actually may not make a lot of sense. And you guys are going a little wild. And so the Falun Gong, which is kind of the one of the bigger of these Qigong groups, although they're no longer calling themselves Qigong, you know, they have this big protest, which we talked about. They actually talk to the premier, I believe. You know, they, they, they have this, like, you know, they're sending all these people out. And then repression. They're banned. A bunch of them are arrested. Uh, and the leadership is either in the clink or flees to America. Leadership, including Li Hongji, the leader of the Falun Gong who, by the way, let me stress this, believes that he can fly as if he were a bird. Or an airplane. Or an insect. So now it's the year 2000. You never had a pulp face? No. No, no, I didn't. Yeah, you're not really that kind of guy. Not really that kind of guy. There was a moment. Yeah, Yeah, it was in the 1990s. Right? Yeah, there was a pulp thing, a big pulp phase in like the early 2000s. I never – do you believe that I participated in any of those musical phases that occurred in that time no, period? No, but it was a fun moment. So – Kind of indie sleaze The moment. year 2000. Lee Hongji is discovering something called indie sleaze in upstate New York. No, Lee Hongji moves to upstate New York. Falun Gong is banned. It becomes a giant deal on the world stage, but really on the American stage. Yeah, the Americans love making a big deal out of this. Yes. Yeah, so the Chi- you know the Chinese government officially labels the Falun Gong as an quote evil cult. Which, by the way, shout out to the Chinese government. Shout out to the Chinese government for having that as like a a category yeah. that you can put things into. <laughs> I mean, it's the very straightforward. It, it's funny because like the thing about like Falun Gong at first is like they and a lot of these Qigong groups at first they're like we're not a religion, we're not a religion, or like we're like a it's like a cultivation practice for those who are already Buddhist. But by now the, we can actually see in two thousand and as the years go by until the present day it actually becomes a religion in itself like they start re- referring to themselves as like religiously persecuted etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. but they're in upstate new york and there's all of these we talked about this a bit at the end of the last episode there's all these sort of americans that are like 
as a way to take a shot at China, kind of glomming onto the Falun Gong, being like, look, the, the Chinese government is persecuting this this Tai Chi group. It's like your grandma. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a, a nice little um, talking out of both sides of the mouth happening with the U.S. and China right now because the U.S. is, of course, like – kind of helping and working China, uh, you know, they, they're they getting them into the WTO, right? So yeah. it's like, we want your goods. We want, we're gonna, we're welcoming you to the world market. We're doing all this. But Classico US style, we also, you know, we also want everyone to know that you repress everyone and oh, communism and oh, no free speech and oh, no one can, no one can live under the boot of the Chinese government. I remember that little man in front of the tank at Tiananmen Square, which by the way, you should see me trying to get back from the fucking liquor store with my bags crossing these goddamn bike lanes. I'm like the tank man myself, scooting this way, scooting this way, scooting with, oh God, why am I little tanky? That's, that's when people call you a tanky, they have it wrong. It's because, yes, I'm a bikey. <laughs> I, dude, I got can you imagine? I mean, we should do it. You could you imagine we told them our real thoughts on bicycles on this fucking podcast? Oh, I was podcast. thinking about the whole Tiananmen Square thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, you mean the incident. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we got we, too, early 2000s, right? Mm. Precise. Pulp is, is huge. I'm 12 years old. And the Falun Gong is sort of looking for these narratives to bring out there. And really, like, all right, we have to, like, the religious persecution thing can really only take us so far. We got to figure out some other ones. Well, they're like, okay, who are we? We are a group of, you know, this is the Chinese diaspora who we just love our little spiritual movements. We put our hands up. We put our hands down. We move our legs left. We move our legs right. Mm -hmm. Why would the evil communist Chinese government be repressing us? Now, that narrative doesn't go so far. You need something that'll really stick. And so they, what they decide to do, go with, organ harvesting. Organ harvesting. Organ harvest. So this is, all right, let's take a trip back actually also to the early 2000s. And do you remember a thing called the bodies exhibit? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, there were a couple versions of this thing. Several. It's kind of like, you know what it really reminds me of is the fucking Van Gogh immersive experience kind of thing. Yeah, but instead of immersive on the outside, it's immersive on the insides. So they want to put all the insides on the outside. Mm. Now, imagine if you married those and so you walk into like an immersive projection of just like someone's like muscle fiber. Sorry. Oh, I thought you meant if you married a body in plastic, because that's if you. You mean if you if you married the no, yeah. Van Gogh and yeah, they should have had his ear in one of those. So, uh, by the way, if someone I know cut off their ear, I'd be like, you gotta. Do you need to mental health? Yeah, you need a wellness check. Wellness all right, check. big giant needle guy in a lab coat putting it in. So early 2000s is also where the bodies exhibit comes out. And I want to be clear is these things are not necessarily linked, but they often are in popular consciousness. The bodies exhibit I just find fascinating because uh, the guy who started, I think his name is Von Hagen, the guy who sort of invented the German, the, the German uh, of course, Yes. who, by the way, always wore a fedora. Really? Always wore a fedora because it resembles that one famous autopsy uh, painting. You know what I'm talking about? You the would- it's probably by the, a Dutch guy uh, named Rembrandt. Rem, yeah, the Rembrandt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very famous – yeah, where the, where part of his body is kind of blurred out because of the kind of well, anyways, sacrilegious – A, a yeah. guy's got a motherfucking uh, black hat on and the modern day version of a old-timey black hat is, of course, the famous fedora. Mm. Uh, Von, he was – this guy is going around putting all these exhibits on. It turns out he was just buying bodies from like Kyrgyzstan. And Russia, and a lot of them were bodies of vagrants uh, who had perished in the cold or, you know, drunks uh, or prisoners. Right. And there was a controversy because – and actually the controversy has really followed them around uh, because a lot of these bodies could not really be sourced to people who had necessarily donated them to science, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of those controversies involved were these bodies of executed prisoners from China. And it was never proven, I don't believe, although I think some of them – China, I believe, does execute people by shooting them, mm. uh, which is, you know, actually, I'll tell you, tell you the way I'd prefer to go out. Uh, but they – I believe some of them did have bullet holes sort of in the base of their neck. That you could see in the exhibit? I don't know if you could see in the exhibit. Maybe you the think skeletons they really, like, did. Like they ended up having to return a lot of the bodies. To who? Uh, to probably the families of the people that they kind of took them from. Mm -hmm. But some of these bodies were sourced from China. And this this is also kind of where these linkages to like Falun Gong, organ harvesting uh, comes from. And so let's actually talk about 
organs in China for a little bit. So the Falun Gong found out pretty quickly is they could actually say whatever they wanted about Falun Gong organ harvesting in China Mm. because no one really knew all that much about it. And... I mean that famously China is so opaque. Yeah. And very, you know, everything's in Chinese. <laughs> it's really hard to read. Well, there's that, but also no one really can get, you know, it's difficult to get, uh, you know, any kind of accurate picture about what's going on, what the government is really doing, yeah, how things are being handled for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, exactly. And so, and many of the people who do try to figure that stuff out have what you might call a capital A agenda. Yes, as well. So exactly. to be clear, the narrative that the Falun Gong has about China and about organ harvesting is that China specifically targets Falun Gong practitioners and harvests their organs either while they're still alive or after executing. And they're doing this at a scale that they lab- label genocidal. Like mm-hmm. we're talking hundreds of thousands of Falun Gong adherents have been murdered. <laughs> Liz can see them. Stop the, doing the pulling motion. The pull, You're pulling, pulling out motion intestines. Here. Is that I'm not what it pulling is? out intestines. Someone's getting a intestinal transplant, although maybe they are. But I'm talking about kidneys. I'm talking liver. I'm talking the motherfucking rarity, the gallbladder. I'm talking about, I'm talking about fucking. What about a heart? A heart? Yes, I'm talking about a heart, Liz. Mm. What do you know about that? I remember the gong conversation, but it's okay. I'm different now. Maybe, maybe a nice fallen gong participant or practitioner would give Liz her, their heart. So, <laughs> so that is the narrative that the Falun Gong has about uh, organ harvesting in China. I want to be clear on that. They they are saying that there's hundreds of thousands, um, if not more, Falun Gong participants who are being hunted for their organs, the most dangerous game and the most precious of bounties. So what's actually, it's like a lot of Falun Gong stuff, they took like a little bit of a germ of a truth and then expanded it into whatever they want. Sure. Right? I mean, this, this, is, this is really their MO for essentially all their property. For a lot of people, actually. That's yeah, how a lot of people lot operate. Of people. It's true. It's true. So the China did, to be clear, until 2015, harvest organs from executed prisoners. That's not like— Don't use harvest organs. That's not the right way to say that. They That's yoinked not, them. No. Yoink. Executed prisoners ended up their bodies being donated— and their organs being donated for people who needed organ transplants. Yeah, yeah. They they had their yeah, they had well, at the end of the day, it's the same. They got their organs taken yeah, out of their body. Yeah, but I bodies. mean, come on. It's like, you know. Well, I will say the practice was harvesting uh, organs is the impression that they're like running some kind of like literal farm that they're harvesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, not like yeah. that. Well, the what they were doing is basically like, you know, I, in some cases this this they may have just like killed someone and taken their organs. I don't know. But from what I understand from interviews I've read about it and from like academic writings about it, most of the time what they do is they would get people to donate their organs by signing on a, you know, a piece of paper yeah, or whatever totally. in exchange for more favorable treatment in the days leading up to their execution, right? right? right. Uh, and this is not exactly what you would call informed consent. You know, you're not really – this is – it's not generally the most uh, – Humane way to go about getting Yeah, no, it's awful. It's totally awful. Uh, However, there is no indication, to be clear, there is literally no indication that people are being hunted or, like, targeted or grabbed for their organs. And as we saw in the Shenyun performance... This was a major theme. They found these girls. They you know, they did these health exams. This is mm. this was uh, you know done in dance uh, in front of us. And the healthier girl was murdered, and then they took her organs yeah. and put it on I don't know the, the gray market. They gave it to a Chinese. Well, official. no, they put it in a little cooler. Remember, put they a little had the cooler. little, thing. Yes, a little exactly. lunch pail. Yeah, well, you know it's uh, it's there's plenty of meats we eat raw, Liz. Mm, fava beans. And a nice Chianti. So China didn't actually have a formal organ donation network set up until about, I think it was 2007, they really started kind of getting it going. I think it really started in like the, like beyond pilot program phase, or maybe that's when the pilot program commenced was in 2010. And now China actually does have a pretty robust voluntary organ donation uh, system in place. Mm. But for a while, and I'm sure uh, to some extent still, China was actually like the number one spot for like, kind of like... uh, Medical tourism, they call mm. it. Like, you know how yeah. people go to Tijuana and get their fucking fill-ins and all that shit? Yeah. Because it's, you know, cheap dentists Most down Americans, there. I mean, not most Americans, but if any American wants to get basically any medical work done, they're, it's 
cheaper to just do it anywhere outside of America. Hair plants in Turkey or, you know, like that. A lot of nose jobs in Turkey, too. That, that Those people who just got killed trying to get, I think, liposuction in Mexico mm. driving down there. Shit. Uh, I don't know if you read about that. No. But, yeah, it was kind of like a, yeah. Um, but, and it's uh, inarguably true. So, like, that is true. Like, there there was a sort of gray market for organs in China. Mm. And I'm, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that the gray market is coming from executed prisoners. And that doesn't mean that the gray market is coming from the Chinese government either. Yeah. I mean, there is, there just I mean, was. Every country definitely has its own. Has yeah, ab- a every country has their own market. version of this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, but organ wait times were super short in China. It, yeah. was, it was a lot easier to get one there in the early 2000s than it was in like medical tourism in terms of getting an organ was very much easier to do in China than in most other countries. Mm. Uh, and there's also, I mean, a lot of, and this is the way it goes in a lot of places. It's true in India. I know this is true in some, uh, I think in Pakistan as well. Um that people will basically sell their organs yeah. uh, as as well. Um, Falun Gong basically takes all of the data that we have, which you know is not all verifiable, but all the data that we have about gray market organ mm. um, or black market organ transfers in China, uh, and says these are all from Falun Gong practitioners, and these mm. are all. And so that's how they extrapolate that data, which is a great way. I mean, look, they've already donated everything. You can't. You can't verify. You can't trust and verify. Exactly. And you just got to trust. It's very similar to how like that whole like 100 million people were killed under communism thing mm. that you see from the uh, victims of communism sure. memorial. How they just attribute everybody who died in China and the Soviet Union and in World War II to the communists. Uh, and that I bring that up uh, because it becomes germane very shortly. So they have the, – they start running this campaign uh, beginning basically in the early 2000s. And they they're saying that like you know uh, we're being hunted for our organs like they're 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 harvesting us en masse and you know we sort of talked about I don't know if we we talked about this on the actual show or just talking about doing these episodes but do you remember in Chinatown in San Francisco when Falun Gong would do the parades and or they would be at Civic Center and I just remember getting out of Bart one time and walking across Civic Center and seeing a guy in a dog cage. Yeah, I would see a ton. Of, I remember the big ones in Embarcadero. Yeah. And there would be just people with big signs parked, like, setting up shop all along the Embarcadero. I feel like they were all usually dressed in white. I don't know yeah, I can't, I can't fully remember. I know a lot um, of them wear yellow. A lot yellow. of signs, a lot of, like, those kind of, like— um, in the vein of uh, anti-abortion protesters where they have the kind yeah. of the graphic images that they've like, you know, printed out and then they kind of paste them onto the, their like poster boards. It was like that. But then for like prisoners in China. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, and some I like garish like no, organ it PETA. photos. It was very PETA like. Yeah. PETA like anti-abortion yeah. like where they're like, look at that baby. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it was very – it was very – yeah, they were very active in San Francisco. Very, very much so. Um, and so that was all based on this organ harvesting narrative. And so the real genesis of how this narrative kind of went from the Falun Gong into the mainstream really begins back in 2007. So the Falun Gong coming to the West and like becoming this like dissident group I'm sorry, 2007, you're saying the year Barack Hussein Obama is elected? I would say that that very year, the one and the same. I'm not even insinuating anything. I just wanted to say that. So there's all of these like friends of Falun Gong organizations starting up in the early 2000s, right? Mark Palmer, who's like a full Reaganite creep, like Freedom House mm-hmm. motherfucker. He starts a big one in the U.S. And then these two guys in Canada, David Kilgore and David Mattis, uh, who are sort of uh, – liberal, conservative Canadians, one's a former MP, the other's a journalist, uh, released something called the Mattis Kilgore Report. Now, this is like really the like big thing in the Falun Gong organ harvesting expand, expanded universe. This is the like this is really like where like the sort of laundered claim of tens of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners being killed for their organs really originates from from this like report on it. Now, most of the sources in that report are from the Falun Gong. Well, naturally, who else are they going to ask? Well, they did some of their like like trying to like get uh, you know inside info from China was like them just calling Chinese hospitals. Yeah. Uh, actually, 
the the problem is is that the Falun Gong's information came from ch- ch- calling Chinese hospitals. Unfortunately, they were not able to replicate that. They were just given recordings of those voicemails or not voicemails, excuse me, phone conversations between two Chinese people. Mm-hmm. And so um, Mattis and Kilgore were not themselves able to replicate that, but they trusted. They didn't, um, what do you call it, verify. Mm. And so we have this like really big report. And this makes a lot of waves. This it be- still makes waves. It's still talked about. <laughs> it's still very much talked about. And this becomes a huge deal. And, we, you know, this is really a big part of the Falun Gong's propaganda uh, up, in, up until the present day. But um, in 2017, it runs into a roadblock when the Washington Post runs a report. The Washington Post of all places runs a report basically saying that actually it kind of looks like according to like all of these like um, – Medical, uh, you know, uh, you know, these like database websites that China's use of the immunosuppressants that you need in order to uh, facilitate recovery from an organ transplant is basically now in line with the rest of, the, of like the world's, but also in line with like their uh, sort of above the board organ donations. Wait, so I don't understand. Can you explain? So, okay. So you have to take these certain drugs uh, in order to have a successful transplant because you're, right. you know, you have, they, they can get rejected or sure. whatever. And uh, China's use of these drugs is monitored, right? Just, I mean, the, the, the drug makers, the people who actually make these drugs, including... You would think because the organ, organ donation around the world is highly uh, regulated, yes. including like how boards approve who is in line for organs, who's available to, yeah, all of it is like tightly regulated. So it would make sense that the drugs required would also be monitored because then that would be like, oh, wait, maybe a bunch of people are doing some organ stuff that we don't know about. Exactly. Yeah, 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 precisely. And to be clear, like organ, like black market organ stuff is still a pretty big thing all over the world. It's huge. But this is a, this is a a fairly decent way to see like if the numbers, the official numbers reported, because at one point China themselves were like, listen, some of these organs that were that are getting uh, put in hospitals and stuff, we don't know where they're coming from, right? These are mm. like greedy doctors and greedy hospitals, like procuring them and then selling them to rich people from out of the country. But at this point, they were like, it's looking like the, the these drugs are basically in line with how many like above the board organs are being donated. So they're saying that, that there's a match. There's a match. We found a match. So this is in 2017. The Falun Gong joins forces with our good friends at the Victims of Communism Memorial. Uh, mm. I'm going to say association because it's a museum. It's an association. It's a way of life, sure. really. Uh, in fact, this one guy, Ethan Gutman, uh, mm. from the Victims of, of Communism uh, Foundation. Yes, Gutman. I wouldn't trust a man named Gutman to talk about organ transplants. Exactly. You know, he thinks the man might have a little, uh, you know, dual loyalties there. Um, but, uh, you know, they all sign this letter. They start attacking the Washington Post. And this is really, as we'll talk about in a little bit, this is the Falun Gong MO, is if you at all go against their narratives, even if you are sympathetic, you hate China or whatever, uh, they will call you an agent of the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, they'll just spam you. They'll just spam they'll you, like you. A motherfucker. So the Falun Gong, I was like, well, this, this report isn't very good for us. So they set up this thing called the China Tribunal. That is set up via their front group, the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China. The, inter- the Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China is a nonprofit that is staffed in large part by members of their media organization, the Epic Times. Or Epoch Times, depending Epo- on how you well, want to. Yeah, depending on it. which continent uh, you're from. Well, I've always pronounced it Epoch. So, to be clear, there's a China Tribunal. Which is made up of like these like MPs and these doctors and these lawyers. And that itself, that tribunal was set up by a, another group that is a Falun Gong front group, if that makes any sense. This tribunal comes out, of course, and this is, I believe, just a couple of years ago with this big like uh, report that says, and again, a lot of Falun Gong sources in this, that says that the Falun Gong are being harvested, are being hunted for their organs, and they're having their organs harvested even while they're still alive. Many of the people involved in that tribunal 
also are members of the Uyghur Tribunal, which is how we hear a lot of the talk of, of genocide and all those mm. sort of things about the Uyghurs. And sure. so... And notes and shoes. Notes and shoes. The notes and shoes and all this kind of stuff. And so this is all like... And you can see it's like the germ of the same thing. Like uh, many Uyghurs were put into these like labor camps, right? Right. And that becomes... There is a literal... There's a These are death camps and it is a genocide. Right. Many people there was there was uh, a lot of sketchy shit going on with the organs in China for a little while, and they didn't have a formal organ donation system. That becomes the Falun Gong is being hunted for their organs and and uh, you know and harvested because they harvested. simply just try to bring peace when the Chinese communists only want war. Well, they do have chi in their bodies, mm-hmm. and so that's which. That's, Wait, don't we all have chi? They have a lot more chi because they've been they they practice they practice I see. and so I get wanting to get people's it's we call it mana in the West mm-hmm. I get wanted we have blue potions and stuff or stuff like that but they 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 seem to think they can only get it via like guts uh, out there and so we see and so all right so China Tribunal will come out with its comes out with its findings and then that is laundered in these headlines from places like Reuters that say things like China Tribunal which sounds so official and so it sounds like, like the China Tribunal the China Tribunal that's just the tribunal kind of thing. about China exactly the China tri- Tribunal is which we will we will call an independent tribunal, which what the fuck does that mean? What the fuck is even a tribunal? I I I actually kind of like tribunals. No, no, but I'm saying like in a non-legal context to just be like the tribunal says. It's like yeah. this is just if you they could call themselves a committee and it would be organizationally and functionally the same thing. Yes. A yeah. club. Listen, a I got to tell you, I participated in a tribunal a couple of years ago. It was no, we had no legal standing. Um, this is a tribunal right here. Well, no, mm-hmm. we're a. No. What's the way the Soviets did? Uh, troika? troika. Troika. No, Truanon is a troika. Naturally. Uh, but you have this way, basically, this way of laundering these talking points, right? You have this, the Epic Times or Falun Gong sets up this front group. That front group sets itself up with another front group. Mm. And then that front group releases a report and that report is sent out to, you know, in press releases uh, to all these journalists, very few of which I'm sure actually have read the report. And then those journalists at these like prestigious outlets just report on the fact that there is a report and we'll maybe give the summary of what they're told that it says, right? Yeah. And so that is like, and that's that's a that's a way a lot of information. I was going to say in almost, like, <laughs> yeah, almost all information that ends up in congressional reports yeah. has gone through this lovely washing machine process. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, this is this is I mean this is still a major talking point. Again, this happened just a couple of years ago with the China. I mean, maybe even less than a couple of years ago with the China Tribunal. Uh, and then they have the Uyghur Tribunal as well. They put a lot of Uyghur stuff in the China Tribunal too. But again, the focus of all this is Falun Gong. So you mentioned the Epic Times, the Epoch Times. No, it's the Epic Times. It's annoying because... I don't know. I whatever. I've just always read an. E- it's an epoch or whatever. But then you see it and it makes no sense. Epoch times. So and everyone says epic times. Epic. I've yeah. never heard someone say like, in the epic of, but maybe I'm just. You know, to pull back the curtain, we had a we had a a screaming fight at the beginning of it this. It wasn't screaming. Well, I was screaming when I went to the, when I pretended I had to go pee and I went to the bathroom. I was screaming. Uh, in there, mm. no, we had we had we had, a, we had an argument, and you know what? We had the best uh, solution that you can ever have to an argument. Both right. Mm. It's pronounced epic in America, epoch in the UK. I know, but I'm saying I've just never heard epic, which is weird. No, no one ever says it because people don't. Yeah, they know do. How to, no, people don't often say it out loud because I'm saying I anecdotally I don't often say it out loud because I've never been completely sure how to pronounce it. But I feel like I've always heard it just in context of, like, art history or history, like, anything to do with, like, the Greeks, the Romans, like, medieval history, the anything Indies like Lee's that. Which epic. perhaps could always be British people because That's, Americans aren't do. really that yeah, interested, you know what? That's, I mean, think of picture who you would think talking about those things. Yeah. It's British people. They do? Which one do they say? Epic. Oh, mm-hmm. no, because they're like, this Reddit is, dude, is epic. Yeah, that's Bacon, though. Yeah. That's a different epic. They're like, 
the narwhal epics. It's epic time. Epic time. Because uh, January 1st, 1970 is when it started. What does that mean? What? It's how computers keep time. Oh, wait. Computers keep time on epic time? Yeah. What is it? What is... What? I mean... That was... That's called... That's Unix time. And that's just, like, when it started. So, like, if you go in your web browser and you do, like, time... You ask it what the time is, it tells you the number of wow. seconds since January 1st, 1970. So it doesn't have any history before then? No. No. Well, that's because that's when... That's, interesting. Well, interesting. I don't so, believe in this timekeeping. So I guess Epic Times, the, uh, interesting, because in all my reading about the Epic Times, I never came across that, but it's literally called Epic Times. That's a really insane uh, title for this publication then. Yeah. Why are they getting... Well, because a also lot of Falun Gong before guys... Before it was... <laughs> it's true, but a lot of Falun Gong guys are... I mean, it's probably named like the Epic or whatever of the age, but it's just... Because I don't think they're that clever. Um, but uh, it is. There are a lot of Falun Gong computer nerds out there. Well, you mentioned them. Yes, we started talking about them. We got to talk about them. I got interviewed by them. You did. Well, that was no. That's New Tang Dynasty. Same office. Same office. It was kind of. It, I'm sure it's more of a duplex situation. It, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the Epic Times over the past, I would say. Uh, what? When was Trump elected? <laughs> he was elected in 2016. Okay. Since about 2017, yeah. the Epic Times has been fucking everywhere. Everywhere. Which is crazy. I remember seeing the Epic Times for a long time. They would have them in little, uh, like, um, like news, you know, free, like, weekly news things mm -hmm. in front of City Hall in San Francisco. Yeah, but it was more of a, like, street sheet kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. It was like a small, it's like how they used to have the onion and shit. Mm. Remember that? That was great. Yeah. Uh, and like the SF Weekly and all version, those things. Which is the funny. print version. Everyone yeah, yeah. It was kind of more of just like a weird kind of like obscure, obviously propagandistic, but like paper that like, why would I read that? But now everyone sees it everywhere. Yeah. In fact, probably your aunt. Well, not your aunt, Brace. Not my aunt. But one's aunt probably follows them on Facebook. They say they. this is a um, from, this is what they say about themselves. And I just really love this. Committed to truth and tradition. Principles that transcend geography, time, and culture. We are dedicated to promoting and restoring those values through traditional journalism. And I'd love to know their uh, definition of traditional journalism. Trad journalism. <laughs> like you have to like you have to write it in Sanskrit, like on like a fucking tablet. <laughs> <laughs> like a rock. Yeah. yeah, their um their tagline is definitely return to tradition, which I guess could make some people Excuse think about me, that. Mr. Og, um the cave woman over there is saying that you bonked her over the head with a large club and sort of put her over your shoulder like a you know, bag of flour, which we don't have yet, but and just brought her into that cave. Is that true? <laughs> Sorry, I was doing traditional journalism. <laughs> So the Epic Times are owned by this uh, extremely opaque media organization that it, they, they called the Epic Media Group. Great name. Mm -hmm. Should have gone with China Tribunal, but, you know, it was yeah. already taken. Um, that includes the TV channel that interviewed you and Young Chomsky, the NTD, the video production company, and then this newspaper, quote unquote, that is called the Epic Times. And, base, and then like a kind of weird loose network of tax-free nonprofits. Yes. Now, I mentioned that they're, they've gotten pretty big. They're definitely not the upstart little street sheet that they Certainly once were. Not. No. They are now printed in 21 different languages in 33 different countries. And they brought in last year, 2020, tax tax return style, over $70 million in revenue. Good God. Which is quite significant. And I think that they're a nonprofit, I think, technically as well, too. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, their revenue was up about fifth, over just over $15 million from the previous year. So 2020, and we'll talk about why, was a really fucking big year for them. Wait, if we became a nonprofit, would we have to um, But all taxes? our filings would be public and all that. I can't have people And we would have to pay taxes. You know? we, uh, we would I mean, still the, have to pay taxes? And everyone would make fun of you for all the gongs. The okay, gong purchases. I think people would like the gong that I bought. <laughs> just line item gongs. Gongs. <laughs> yeah. Gongs. Entire. Entire thing entire is Entire budget is gongs. <laughs> uh, everyone loves the classic tweet. Gongs and live lobster. Because <laughs> I do. Sometimes I fucking buy lobsters and I just set them free. So 
they bring in a lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, that seems pretty crazy for uh, basically an organization that no one knows who actually owns. It's really, yeah, it's very unclear who like actually, because there's like people on the, there's like people who are on the masthead and there's like the publisher or whatever of, of Epic Times. But like, it's pretty clear that it's just like, it's Lee Hong Ji is probably the number one, but like, Underneath him, nobody really knows. Well, that's the thing. It's like you have sort of access to the editorial line. You, you mentioned the publisher, all of that for the paper. But the paper and the video production company mm-hmm. and all these other nonprofits are under the media group. And no one actually knows who owns and runs that thing. The Daily Beast was like doing a little, you know, prying into it a little bit. I mean, again, 2020 was a big year for both Epic Times and people looking into the Epic Times. Um, and they were able to find this little benefactor named Hua Yi Zhang, who was on one of the tax forms um, from NTD. And they linked him back to an old place called Renaissance Technologies, where he worked. It was a hedge fund in the 2000s that was run by Robert Mercer. And so what they were kind of like trying to connect the dots on, you know, conspiracy board style, was saying that perhaps Robert Mercer, who, of course— whose old friend Steve Bannon is quite close with the Epic Times, had his, you know, sticky little rich shrimp fingers in the old, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something funny to say, but basically was like funding this whole thing. That would make sense because Mercer was connected with Cambridge Analytica, right? Yeah, I mean, Mercer's got his hands and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, He's got to have huge hands. Weren't people (laughs) saying Trump had small hands? I've never really looked at them. I think I they were doing that. That was like a real like blue pill. Like he's got small hands because he's, he's got a small dick. I got a small dick. So what we do know is that Epic Times was founded in the in the year two thousand mm-hmm. by a guy named year. John Tang. John Tang. Yes. Now he is a Chinese American practitioner of the Falun Gong. Wow. What a surprise. But he's also the current president of New Tang Dynasty, the TV network. Wait, so it's named after himself? Yeah. Because I was like, <laughs> yo. I mean, no. It's named, can you imagine if that's like, what he was doing? Uh, like, it's what's well, the New Tang Dynasty, so don't <laughs> worry about that. And I'm in charge. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no relation. Man, but maybe. How maybe do you relation. Get, so I, just to pause real quick. How do you get a dynasty? Like, I understand that, like, uh, it's, you know, it's like this Four one fam- family or whatever ruled or whatever, the royal lineage. But, like, how long do you need to be in power? Four championships. F- Four championships. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, I could get one, you think? By the way. I don't want to talk about it. You want to talk about it? No, I don't, actually. What? Food got your chest? You don't think? You don't? You don't? Liz's smile is so big right now. I don't want to fucking talk about it. I think it's really, I will say this. A lot of people have a cab in the bio, but the second <laughs> yes. that they can call the fucking league office and get another motherfucker suspended, they're mm-hmm. cheering on the old cops. <laughs> I think it's fucking great how many small dicked NBA, NBA watching bitches love their little pearls and love clutching them. Mm-hmm. So would you, would you, you would say that Draymond was right to do it? No, I'm not saying that. I think that the suspension is total fucking bullshit. He got suspended? Yeah. Yeah, it's bullshit. And it's such bullshit that you have literally every single player coming to his defense, which you don't see. You have ESPN coming to his defense and the fucking league office sending the guy who made the decision out on a media tour to defend the choice because it's so insane. Did someone sit on another person at some point? No, he fucking suplexed and pulled him down. That's It's all bullshit. Mm-hmm. I listen. I support you, and so I support whatever you support in this. People want to say whatever. I mean, I think that like he got ejected. That's fine. Eject him. But mm. then that's the punishment. Why you gotta suspend him too? Yeah. And why are you cheering it? It's like, why are you fucking cheering it on? Just let him play. Just let him play. Let him play. It's the fucking playoffs. It's the playoffs. I just think everyone's a cop and a moralizer, and I think my favorite was when I think people were like. Treating it like it's a courtroom and not – they're like, this isn't the WWE. And it's like, well, actually, it does have more to do with – more. it's closer to the WWE than it is to some fucking, like, courtroom. Like, mm-hmm. come on, man. It's entertainment. I don't know. Well, I but say I get it. Man. Everyone hates the Warriors. We've been whooping your ass for fucking 10 years. I get it. So mm-hmm. it's fine. It's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Like, be a cop, man. I get it. I would love to be a police officer. 
<laughs> a lot of a lot of like really, you know, I I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> I, this is by the way, by the way, by the way, when she says I don't want to talk about it. I have so much more to say. I know, I know, but we. Gotta... I have a lot of NBA takes I could get off, but I won't. So John Tang, he have a footprint-free chest. He, you know, he starts this this scrappy little media upstart <laughs> in the early two thousands. It's like, oh, m- maybe we'll report on on technology and and, and Silicon Valley news, or, or or maybe we'll report on Wall Street, or uh, the, I don't know w- w- what else. Uh, no, he he's, he starts this Epic Times uh, Falun Gong sort of like news sheet, right? Yeah, and it was like pretty. I mean, it was pretty small. Mostly uh, Chinese for, language. Yeah, mostly Chinese language. Not very influential. Again, like if you live in a city that had a big like Chinatown basically and a large presence of like Chinese Americans or Chinese uh, expats, then you would probably see it. But otherwise, not so much. Yeah. Um, in 2005, they published something that it still gets referenced by politicians uh, called the Nine Commentaries. It was literally, I think, just yeah. referenced – by one of the guys with the TikTok bill, you know, and they're trying to like <laughs> yeah, fucking yeah, push yeah, this yeah. shit. Which, but that put, by the way, that puts us in a very difficult position mm. because the bill isn't good, but we do want to ban TikTok. Yeah, I yeah, that bill is really bad actually. Yeah, and I know. Restrict, yeah, the Restrict Act, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and they kind of lost it's like us not on about that. TikTok. It's not about TikTok. <laughs> if you put, a, I'll say this: if you put up a bill to ban TikTok, just flat out, that's it. I think you know what I think you should do is just put a cap on up on content uploads. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, just cap the uploads. Well, and you would be able just starting at that would slow everything down so much. I mean, you could never do it because you'd actually have to take on the tech companies. Yeah, but that would slow a lot of shit down, including a lot of young people with schizophrenia. Non commentaries. What are they? So it was just a bunch of basically uh, anonymously written testimonials of crimes committed by the CCP. Um, That was like their big splash. Yeah. And yeah, it still gets referenced. Um, They really still like with the paper, they haven't gotten that far. There was like at one point in 2006, one reporter was able to kind of get into – uh, like the white a White House event, which was the first time they kind of got any publicity. It was when then Chinese President Hu Jintao was visiting the White House, and they were able to kind of like you know they they kind of like made a scene and were like, oh, evil, evil people will die. Yeah, it was yeah, like not yeah. really. I, I don't think it like actually he was great just, press I for think, the yeah, they, paper. They, the reporter just yelled at him, and, it, it, uh, and yeah. I, I, it, I believe they also said at one point, um, you're Chinese. According to the New York Times, uh, one of the sales directors, they described their early years as basically just printing 800 papers a week, no subscribers, and utilizing a, quote, throw it in their driveway for free marketing strategy. I do – I feel – I might be making this up, but I feel like I used to see them in the sunset when I was walking to work all the time. Yeah, look, if it works for pizza delivery companies, it's going to work for your little paper. Works for the examiner. Yeah. You know, just throw them in the fucking driveway. Yeah that, yeah, that thing's worthless. No one likes that. But it's a pretty small motherfucking paper, right? Nobody's really reading this thing. Yeah. Fast forward to like 2010. Now we're out of the 2000s. Mm-hmm. We're in the aughts. We're in the aughts. Wait, the post aughts. Wait, yeah. is the, the aughts you know, is the 2000s. Here's my thing. is what's there's, the t- post? It's what's the 10s, people call it. But the oh, thing is, on. the 2010s, the thing is there's no good name for either of them. So I do my best not to reference either decade in I such a way. I think aughts is funny. Aughts, also, yeah, I it, like when people say naughty oddies. The I naughty think it's so funny. Good. Yeah, but it never like <laughs> caught on to the fact where pe- it's not like the 20s where it's got some like tang yeah. to it, you know? Okay, 2010. Lee hong is taking questions at the annual New York Conference Falun Gong. And he basically starts direct – he takes a question from uh, someone I think who was working at one of the like smaller Epic Times offices, basically looking for direction and was like, how do we like really make this paper a thing? And this is what he says. He says, some of our media give no thought to what they're doing and always put Falun Gong out front. The Falun Gong Epic Times, the Falun Gong and DTTV and DTV – It's hard to say. The Falun Gong this, the Falun Gong that. Some students just insist on doing that when, in fact, they don't need to. The students who run these media need to think about how to better cement the position of our Dafa disciple-run media as part of society and become regular media in ordinary society. 
And so that kind of becomes the direction for the Epic Times post 2010. Mm -hmm. They're basically like, stop being fucking weird. Stop talking about the organ harvesting. Stop like putting it on the front of the paper that you are Falun Gong and just like become invisible and become normal. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Okay. So it's like our show. Absolutely. So Epic Times does become, if not normal in the way that a regular person would use that word or think of it, at least normal in the sense that like other like journalists see them as sort of normal, right? Yeah. I mean, they're definitely sort of just like fade into a general sort of, they're yeah. like, oh, that's just like kind of a weird paper, but it's upstart. It's fine. There's like real journalists that work there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they win awards. Like the New York Press Association gives them a bunch of awards <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Which they still like bank on, by the way. Yeah. They still like put, Which, oh, we've been winning awards. We still get awards and stuff. Yeah. No, they definitely, but they do. Um, and they, one of the ways that they're able to kind of grow their outreach is through Facebook. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like a really early, I guess, early um, user or manipulator of yes. the Facebook algos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is this is sort of what I was talking about with the Cambridge Analytica stuff. It's like they really – some some people here really knew what they were doing and how mm. to fucking game this shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Facebook changed its algorithm back in like 2015 and that's when – the uh, Epic Times realized that they had to, in order to kind of maintain the same kind of reach that they were getting prior to that, yeah. they had to like pivot fully to just like viral content craziness. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And just get the news feed to kind of pick up as much as they could, as much stories as they could, and as much viral content in order to keep getting the clicks and the eyes to. I mean, this was pages. the really the, the name of the game, especially at this point in time, is to literally, it's a BuzzFeed strategy. Put out as much shit as possible, and you will, people will just click on it. Like yeah. you really just got to just keep putting shit out. And their thing too is they did. I mean, I feel like this was such a big trend at this point of just like putting up like, oh look, seal a sea lion meets a seal for the first time, or like, yeah. yo, this dog and a cat are friends, and they also live with the mouse that they don't eat. And it's like these sort of like cute videos and then on their websites they would have like just like story after story after story after story. Remember, I'm sure that obviously websites all, all still do this, but H slash T, you know what I'm talking about? Hat is hat tip. Like when an article is just an article from another website but just rewritten kind of uh -huh. and then they write HT, that website, like that was a lot of Falun Gong stuff. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, it's all very stupid but it was all very successful. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I would say that the way they kind of uh, I don't know, it's like took advantage of Facebook's algo mm -hmm. change is like pretty unparalleled. They were able to basically set up this network of shell news companies similar to like kind of everything else they do. So you got shell tax companies, you've got shell, shell talking point tribunals, and you've got shell news companies. And so you have all these, you know, you've got some of them that are like kind of maybe famous right-wing sites. You know, you have like America Daily, which has like over 1 million Facebook followers. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them are like not related at all. There's like, you know, Funny Family or like, you know, oh, like you're saying with the like dog, mouse, cat friend video doggy diner fans totally san francisco <laughs> and they would just like all these different sites would just post viral videos news pieces aggregated from other sites just growing 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 yeah yeah and of course as always they would use a lot of click farms in order to drive all of this even bigger and faster and it fucking worked it works you know, this shit works. Yeah, they become fucking massive. And I think this is when the Epic Times, like this period in like 2015 to like, I mean, I would say from like 2015 to like 2019, 2020 is when like everybody who didn't know what the Epic Times was found out what the fuck yeah. the Epic Times is. Yeah. Because it was everywhere on the internet. Yeah. But especially Facebook and YouTube at one point too. Well, all of it worked really, really well basically up until a point because after the election of Trump in 2016, Facebook came under all that pressure to like crack down on fake news, yeah. click farms. You mentioned the Cambridge. I don't know. All that shit like came, came down on Facebook. And so Facebook had to, you know, crack down on all of this and Epic Times, of course, caught up in a big sweep. Yeah. So in 2020... Facebook took down like 500 pages and accounts Jesus. linked to something that I guess they called Truth Media, which was like a network that Facebook claimed was linked back to Epic Media. Yeah. So like 
they at that point not even like real epic media groups it's like, to be on there. It's like a it's like an astroturf other network that's just yes. being run by Epic Times. That they think that they're trying to link. Yeah. It's like so It's funny. so funny because all this stuff still happens except it's so much more sophisticated now in so many ways. Like, I don't know if you were reading about that Israeli company that like is, and there's always, there's actually quite a few Israeli companies that are under siege, but like the methods that they have are just like, they make this stuff look like fucking child's play, you know? Yeah. I just think all, everything is like this. Everything's everything. fake on the internet, yeah. Um, but there really was like a great convergence that happened with the Epic Times and the 2020 election. Um, like over the the Trump years, their revenues like quadrupled. Yeah, they were. <laughs> I mean, they, they just huge. they just they just like took this. They took a great leap forward, and there was a ton of fucking viral content. There was so much. Uh, there's such a great opportunity for anything anti-China. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really mean. was. There was a kind of like perfect match in Falun Gong heaven because people just couldn't get enough viral content and couldn't stop reading about how awful the CCP was, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it's it's the Epic Times like was always had like a conservative slant to it. Yeah, return to tradition. The return to tradition. But uh, but with Trump's election and in the ensuing years, really leading up to 2020, they got like just more and more and more wrapped up. It's just like how so many people went really fucking insane and kind of got lost in the sauce. Mm. The Falun Gong got lost deeply within the sauce as if they were just a lone clove of garlic swirling in this big, big sauce, sauce pot and these beefy arms that you think belong to a giant guy. But, oh, no, it's Nonna, my Italian grandmother. She's – the it's Nazi Pinocchio next to her. Oh, don't look up there. But um, – the Falun Gong go fucking wild for Donald Trump. Yeah, this is also from the New York Times. Epic Times editors seem to have this almost messianic way of viewing Trump as the anti-communist leader who would bring about the end of the Chinese Communist Party. Oh, wow. You're telling me that like a Falun Gong affiliated news group had a like end of days vision for bringing this. down. Come on. I mean, it is kind of crazy how perfect this like. Match was for them. Really was. So there was this like kind of it's it's weird because it really is this like good mix of actual insane beliefs about Trump, and then also cynical opportunism. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, Trump really ran. Um, I mean, think about the end of the the Obama years, right? There was like TPP, mm -hmm. and Trump was really like coming out, essentially like opposed, like coming out the gate swinging against China. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, he started that trade war pretty early on and the Falun Gong were just like this. This is our motherfucking guy right here. Yeah. I mean, they I, they hired this like ex Tea Party strategist to help them actually become politically influential, which they had really never done before. Right. They'd always been just kind of this like weirdo, bizarre group that I, you know, I think that some people within the U.S. government viewed as like, oh, we sure we can like throw them a bone. They seem like a, a great vehicle to be annoying to a, to the Chinese government, but like nothing really more so than that, right? Yeah, it's like, okay, any deal, you know, will break you off a piece. Yeah. But like... But it was during the, the Trump years that they actually decided, no, wait, actually, I think that, you know, I've got some ideas about policy. Yeah. And I think I should be in there. And so they actually get F Falun Gong shit into the Trump White House, which had never... They had never reached that kind of level before. It's, ever. Fu it's funny because the, the, as far as I know, the uh, White House Press Correspondents Association or whatever, like they're the people who sort of credential you to get into, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like the, the briefings and like the, the Q&As they do with the president. Um, and they deny credentials to the Epic yeah. Times. And I think to One American News, which is also, of course, Fallon Gong linked. Um, but, I mean, owned by a, a different set of insane people. And uh, Trump's Trump's campaign, or excuse me, not his campaign, his his administration actually like gave them visitor passes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And allowed them and they were just like calling them. There's a video of one of the reporters handing Trump a piece of paper, and him looking at it as he was leaving. And it's like, what is say on there? A, a Epic Times reporter. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. Probably knowing the knowing the Falun Gong, probably something that Trump was just like, what? Yeah, some probably something about like you know. They're harvesting all of yeah, our organs. Yeah, yeah, or just like the, the you know, the, there's a seat for you at the Dharma wheel. 
So one of the big angles that was a, they were able to kind of use to attract a huge audience over these you know past some odd years was basically by presenting themselves as truth tellers in a sea of fake news, which I got to say, cl- that's a classic angle. Classic. I mean, I get it. I get it. What, there's what, fake what news you, everywhere. There's fake news everywhere. There's a fake news media. But they would basically be like, look, we're covering stories and angles that the mainstream media isn't going to touch. Right, classic persecution complex, similar to the way they approach other things. Mm-hmm. But so they would they publish. I mean, they truly did. They published a lot of stories on what quote unquote Spygate, what they called Spygate. God, you, I can barely even remember that now. It was the Obama campaign spying on Trump? Yeah, right? which like Trump really like. I hate saying this. Shit, should I say this or not? I can't think of anything other way to say this. He blew his wad on he this. He blew his wad on this, <laughs> which was. Sorry, sorry, everyone, not for that. Um, because he kind of made it seem like Obama himself was like sitting in the Oval Office with a little, like you know, little headphones little on, like listening yeah. in. When it's the like conversation, it's like no, obviously the NSA is is spying on everyone, and they're pulling as much as they're just intercepting as much as they can, and and that was true. Yeah. Um, but he really painted it in such a way that maybe it was good for his followers, but it's you know, but, but not good it, for anyone. Kind of like it didn't, and it wasn't. I mean, just from a purely cynical perspective, it didn't make a good story. You know what I mean? Well, like, I mean, mainstream media was able to really dismiss it as a conspiracy yeah. theory. Um, but and for Epic Times, they were really publishing stories on it. And for all of Trump's supporters and people who were just trying to find info on the story, you couldn't find any reporting except for on Epic Times. Because remember during lot. those years, there was just like kind of a that mass media blackout on anything that could be construed as somewhat favorable to Trump. Yeah, I know. It, it's you know? It, Yeah, it's really striking. I mean, just to, to remember back to that time, it was really all... It was just all this kind of stuff. And the other thing that really, I mean, they really globbed onto, which, again, makes a lot of sense, was their coverage of 5G coronavirus, get the facts. 5G coronavirus, get the motherfucking facts. And they were really latched onto the whole China virus thing, which, you know, like we said, was in the fucking show. Yeah. You know, at the end. And they got, you know, it got them in, I think that got a lot of, a lot of people watching Epic Times a lot more because of the way that they were reporting how, you know, COVID was being handled in China. And so many, like, disinformation specialists pivoted from Trump fake news time to then COVID fake news time. Exactly. And so the, w- one of the things that Epic Times really cornered in that market especially was sort of coming off as a real news site, if like right-wing conservative slanted, but like a real news site. Because if you look at the Epic Times homepage, actually now they added a CRT section on their front oh. page. Yes. Does Quillette still exist? No, Quillette fucked up during the coronavirus and they came out as pro-vaccine. And so they basically lost all of their audience. Interesting. Yeah, what's her name? That, that fucking... Um, She's... Gl- the, man, sort of... Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, 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 they had the wind taken out of their sails. They're fucking done. Um, but uh, and also, of course, there's like Barry Weiss and shit. That's just like... Right. She's much more agile. Yeah, Substack, took yeah. Her, yeah, took her place. So... Um, they were really a big source for a lot of the COVID stuff, that for like the alternative view of COVID. Right. To be clear, the person who is the head of this organization believes that 300 million people have died. I sent Liz this this morning. <laughs> 300 million people have died of COVID in China, and the Chinese government has covered it up. Yeah. I like, can't tell. It's always my favorite thing was like, wait, they think COVID is real, and it's killing the Chinese, and that the co- Chinese government is covering it up, but also that it's fake. Yes. And that the COVID biosecurity regime of the Chinese government is um, strangling what liberty is left in the country. I think right? that because because China because they brought out the zero COVID sign. During, yeah. By the way, zero COVID moronic way to deal with COVID. Uh, but they brought out that sign during the the fucking uh, whatever the that final dance. And they were, but they were saying, because I think from what I can understand is you're correct. Like they think COVID is real and it's actually significantly, significantly worse than what we've been told. Uh, But also the vaccines are fake. Right. But you can cure it by basically doing Tai Chi. Right. None of it really makes any sense. 
No. They really did. I mean, they made a lot of um, like made for TV, a.k.a. YouTube documentaries that got them in a lot of trouble with the YouTube police, but also not before there were like millions and millions of views on these things. Died suddenly. I will say that Lee, in March of 2020, he was in NYC. This is right when COVID was hitting, right? And he, this is what he had to say about it. He said, Plagues and pestilence, by their very nature, are arranged by the gods. When humans become corrupt in their hearts, they will generate karma, fall sick, and suffer calamities. It has come to eliminate the followers of the evil party and those who go along with the evil CCP. So the official line of the Falun Gong which is, of course, the organization behind the Epic Times, was that COVID was sent to Earth by gods in order to punish the followers of the Communist Party. Well, this makes sense because they've actually been trying to save lives. The Falun Gong's big campaign really prior to their modern incarnation, although I guess it's probably still wrapped up in it somewhere, uh, is that they were trying to get people to leave the Chinese Communist Party. Right. And they were saying they had all of these, you know, like they were saying like 10 million people are leaving every year or whatever. They would sort of make up these fantastical numbers. They're not great with numbers. Uh, I'll say that. And so they were actually trying to save all those people's lives. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they, they failed in their mission and we got coronavirus COVID-19. Mm. Well, all this fights say they're basically the, – the Epic Times is now banned from advertising on Facebook. <laughs> it hasn't worked out too well for them except for that's totally fine because now they go crazy on YouTube. So do you remember the Which ad? is just the Wild West by the way. Yes. Yeah. Still. It's, it's – it's, I think it's weird because YouTube, you can get banned so easily from it. But you can also kind of put whatever you want. YouTube's ungovernable. Yeah, it's fully ungovernable, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I remember so vividly those Epic Times ads because they were playing yes. before like every video uh, of that fucking guy. What's his name? Roman? Yeah. I can't remember. I can't the fucking glasses. Name. Yeah. Who had like this slight accent or just It's the same weird. voice. It's the same like – like way of speaking as the fucking guy at the show, that uncanny Valley Colin yes, Jost yeah, presenter voice. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, where he's like, he's like, uh, confused by the news. Would you like to know the truth? Perhaps you should check the Epic Times. Look, this is what the Chinese communists say, but actually here, ding, 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 and then there's like a change in the paper. And they would have this these is the true story. Incredible graphic design on these, not yeah. actually incredible, but you know, this well, like professional graphic looking is graphic passion. designy person kind of shit. Um, and he'd be like un- unrolling the newspaper and being like, look, we have a 10 page spread on like the COVID crisis it's a in very China. very large newspaper. Giant motherfucking newspaper right there. Yeah, I mean, they spent from in. 2020, from January to November, they spent $1.8 million on YouTube ads, <laughs> which God. is not insignificant. I mean, mostly ads saying that they were like, you know, we're we're giving a real look at the world. Like, oh, we're not like any other media outlet. Um, you know, I think one was like, while some media outlets have been echoing propaganda, the Epic Times has been exposing the Chinese Communist Party use of espionage over the past 20 years. Uh, they had a lot that were all about um, the – Black Lives Matter protests. They did not love those. Yeah. And they ran, I mean, they really ramped up during the George Floyd protests, yeah. their ad buys. So they had one one of their YouTube channels, Facts Matter. Which, by the way, they don't. Feelings do. That's nice. They do. Feelings do matter. Yeah. Um, that, you, I mean, they have 1.25 million subscribers. <laughs> Which also, by the way, we don't know how many of those are real, but I'm sure a lot of them are. Yeah, and a one and a half million views. I mean, regardless of whether or not they're real, that means that this stuff is getting out there and getting promoted by the algorithms and whatever yep. because it's getting clicks and whatever they, whatever we call views, it's getting them. Uh huh. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. They also, I remember during the Trump years, they also really flirted with QAnon stuff. Mm. Like they became like the most. Well, I guess Fox did it too to some extent, but like they they became like the one of the more prominent uh, news organizations. I mean, it's really hard to call them that, but whatever. Uh, that like had this like sort of sympathetic pro. I mean, they would never come out and be like QAnon is real, but they would always have these like sort of sympathetic pro Q things that were in the in the Epic Times. And this was like because again, like my knowledge of this stuff from when I knew about like first started paying attention to Epic Times, it was mostly like. 
like kind of conservative stuff and based on China. Mm. And then it's like all of a sudden it's like BLM, fucking 5G coronavirus, get the facts. CRT. Like Kung flu. What's up? CRT. CRT. Yeah, exactly. Now, like I'm saying, they have a CRT section on their newspaper. I mean, they just became this fully like right wing far right wing media organization yeah. but they have this weird veneer of respectability with with certain like not to anybody who spends 2 seconds looking up what they are but to like sort of these like prominent right wing like politicians and stuff because of their anti china bona fides right yeah. and because of that pedigree that they do have and because the Falun Gong are still useful in the sense that they can be used to like poke at china and the organ harvesting stuff and all that like they they really became like um I don't know. It's just it's 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 just crazy that this was kind of like their second breath of life. Thank you, Donald Trump. And of course, too, they work with friend of the pod, Mr. Collar himself, Stephen Hussein Bannon. Yeah, I mean, he he got in with them pretty early on, which makes sense. He hates China. He hates China. And he, you know what? And he loves video production. You bring a weird Chinese guy to New York. Steve Bannon will get lunch with him yeah. and take money from him. Yeah, He made a movie, which I can't believe I hadn't actually heard of before we started um, putting together notes of this episode, uh, in 2019 called Claws of the Red Dragon. Which is a great name. Yeah. This was about the Huawei controversy over stealing IP, which honestly, that was like in the description for the movie. And when I was yeah. watching the trailer and reading about it, I had to then look up Remember the Huawei thing yeah, and I was like what, what is this this was all bullshit if he was really smart he would have done a documentary about uh, how John Cena learned to speak Chinese like that how are you gonna make a movie about someone stealing IP they did it he, was, it, they, he made a courtroom slash spy drama basically about IP theft this is like you know ever With since the, the social going. network yeah. every fucking filmmaker thinks that they can make someone typing on the computer exciting you can't <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't. really can't he only did it he did it once he did it well let's move on you can't do it people make fun of like those old hacker movies for people like typing and be like oh they got two zip in here like I need to do I need to uh, back end the mainframe to get around mm. these and like making it look like like in hackers where the, they're like the great one is the net the with, net with Sandy I've Bullock I've never seen that thank you first of all she looks fucking this is prime Sandy I'm gonna, like, lo- I'm my gonna God. let me let me be let me be the judge of this. Sandra Bullock, the net. We God, we didn't we don't make brunettes like we used to. We we really do not. No, but okay. You know, Sandra Bullock. I'm gonna be honest here. Say something a little controversial. Might call me the Epic Times opinion pages here. Never really had the hots for old Sandy Bullock. But you don't like brunettes. I like brunettes. Yeah, but you love blonde. I prefer blonde. I'm a gentleman. Yeah, um, Sandy. I'm telling you. Okay, what's the what's the classic one where she's like becomes a star in so, while you were sleeping, oh my god! First of all, well, my man knows the it? outfits. And while you were sleeping, incredible. I think she became a star from Speed. Speed? No, no. But that was—I think—that was before Speed. Speed was ninety-two, right? I don't know. Ninety-four. Yeah, while you were sleeping is earlier. <gasps> no. Wow. Wow. Hit him with the mea culpa, Liz. That's crazy. Okay. That's in ninety-five. Well, I wonder crazy. when it was shot. Shit. I don't think I didn't. I don't think I missed that. Speed two was she in? Uh, yes. That's the only one I've seen. But uh, that's weird. Speed 2 is not very good. Um, uh-huh. That's crazy because I think, I feel like While You Were Sleeping exists in a different time than Speed. Well, anyways. Just like vibe-wise and outfit-wise. It used to be that going on the internet was kind of like when you enter the Matrix, right? And that's how they would be presented in movies. There'd be a guy in front of a, a big monitor, but he'd be at a crazy desk with all, a bunch of other gizmos around him. And now it's like a guy at with like a MacBook on a desk being like, you know, and they just have to put music or something behind it. You know, it's, it's bold. Yeah. It's most places, boring. Yeah. I mean, it's very difficult to make it exciting, which is why, I mean, which is why, uh, who did the social network? Fincher? Fincher. Yeah, yeah. Why he was able to kind of make it interesting. Never saw you know? that. But, uh, it's, but it's kind of like, like a lot of drama Sam, in a different way. Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. So now they just do everything on their well, phones. Bannon, Bannon, by the way, Man, it, what is I don't know what's up because Miles Guo is now arrested. Who's mm-hmm. remember call call back to our episode I believe with Robbie Martin about that character. But he, any freaky deaky Chinese guy who comes to New York, I'm saying he's he's got to hang out with them. He's got to make something with them. He loves to connect. Uh, but also speaking of 
This is driving me insane constantly. Speaking of Steve Bannon movies, remember when it came out that he did inter- like uh, interview training with Jeffrey Epstein? And yeah, didn't he try to like – he's like trying to position it as this hard-hitting interview and it was obviously that he's doing media training? So obvious. He's, even from the, the footage he selected from the trailer, it's so obvious he's doing media training. It's but, also like so crazy that you're like, Tim, I need media training. I'm about to go down for like craziest pedophile in history. I'm calling Steve Bannon. I got to get Bannon on the horn. Why? One of the best talkers in America. Frankly, is that a like, yeah, because you know it from the inside sort of situation? Like, I, I'm just like, my question is, is like, where are Steve Bannon's wins supposed to come from? Because since Donald Trump won, he's kind of been just losing. Although he's yeah. got a pretty popular show. I mean, War Room is really popular, very popular. I yeah. think he's doing okay. He got kicked to the curb pretty quickly. He, I mean, he was living on Trump Miles Guo's yacht. Remember, yeah. he was uh, when he, he got tried served. to open that weird school in Italy. Yeah, it didn't work. Which he's always, but that scheming. didn't work. And people think it's because of the fascist thing, but it's actually because Italians like we don't want to learn to read. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, it's the crazy thing is because it came out. There was like all these reports that he had. Like it came out that he did this media training for Epstein. Obviously, like a week later, he puts out this trailer for a fake documentary called like Exposing the Monster yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's how you get ahead of the story. That's, exactly. That's my Bannon. And it's uh-huh. it's him just clearly doing media coaching for <laughs> Epstein in this crazy HD stuff. And they're like, uh, stuff, this crazy HD like vision. So the most high definition we've ever seen Epstein. Um, but, uh, and then it, it just never came out. That was like a year or two ago. Yeah. It just never came out. So if you do know Steve Bannon, please ask him about that mm. because I'm, I'm de- desperately awaiting the 10 hours of footage you apparently have. So one final thing too. So the, the Epic Times... We all know, savvy media consumers know that it's owned by the Falun Gong. And if you look at a lot of the stories that they publish about China, there will be a preponderance of Falun Gong-centric stories. Mm. But they they don't like say at the masthead, like, this is a Falun Gong newspaper. And it's mostly like many of the visible people in a lot of their English language media are like these kind of like white conservatives that you'd see most, you know, that you'd see like at One America News or whatever, kind of B-team, C-team style conservatives. Uh, but the truth is, is that almost everybody in any position of power at the Epic Times is a practicing member of the Falun Gong, including the uh, publisher of the Epic Times, a guy named Stephen Gregory. And so NBC News put out this like this basically like expose on mm-hmm. Epic Times, I think 2020. Yeah, it was pretty big. Yeah, it was like it was a pretty big one. Um, and, you know, it's 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 pretty standard stuff like we've, we've talked about here. But like, you know, it's like every, it's like what everyone knows about uh, Epic Times, right? Like they are this cult newspaper owned by the Falun Gong who does all this crazy Facebook shit and uh, puts out these you know, oftentimes pretty insane stories. Epic Times published a rejoinder uh, sort of interview with Stephen Gregory, and obviously it's it's all like bullshit, but it's very funny, the responses to some of the stuff. So uh, this is sort of a Q&A from Epic Times to Stephen Gregory, and I- I'll read the question, Liz, if you could read the, the response from the Mr. Publisher here. Is the Epic Times predominantly staffed by volunteers? Do some Epic Times interns, volunteers, or employees live in a shared home? This is simply inappropriate. What bearing do individuals' living arrangements have on the journalism of the Epic Times? Would NBC ask New York Times journalists if they share an apartment? This digging into private lives can have only one motivation, to find something that can be used to discredit the Epic Times. Which is a, by the way, if you're ever being accused of labor trafficking for your little media organization, this is the response that you want to do. Also, NBC, you should ask um, and New York Times journalists if they live together. Yeah. Just because I'm curious. Yeah, me too. You got a roommate? God, how horrible would it be to have your roommate work at the New York Times? Oof. So I think one thing we didn't really talk about too much, but kind of gestured towards, I guess... Is just, um, you know, how much this stuff is. It sounds all 80s. It sounds kind of 90s. Oh, and now it sounds kind of 2000s. But Falun Gong is all very much still very active. Yep. They have a kind of media arm that is 
massively influential in a way that is like a little shocking. Yeah, not just, by the way, in America. We mostly talked about America, but it's massive in Germany, massive in Australia. Yeah, South Korea. South Korea as well. Uh, Canada. Vietnam. Of course, Canada. They have a huge presence in Canada. They're one of the biggest media companies in Vietnam. <laughs> I mean, and all of that is like because, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the U.S. drums of war are beaten on China has really like given a lot of this stuff like a second wind, mm -hmm. basically. Um, there's sort of a reason now for a lot of the this these old sort of like, you know, propaganda stories to like come back out of the woodwork. And so you're kind of seeing it, you know, this organization can be useful again, even as like, you know, crackpot and cultish as it is. Yeah, I think the Falun Gong, Epic Times, all this sort of like conglomerate, right? The Li Hongzhi uh, empire is really going to start being used more um, by probably more mainstream sources, maybe, uh, as this new rivalry, Cold War, whatever you want to call it, with China really ramps up. Um, I mean, their utility, it differs from the utility of some other like diaspora groups that, that like kind of are embraced by the American uh, government or the elite. Uh, in that they are really mostly useful, it seems like, for propaganda, right? The mm -hmm. Falun Gong is really excellent. Oddly enough, not in terms of epic times, but with the organ harvesting stuff, uh, in laundering, um, you know, these these facts and figures that they kind of just invent. Right. Um, and then having those embraced. And these atrocity stories. Atrocity stories are really, really, really useful, right? I mean, look how hard the Uyghur stuff was pushed and then really dropped. Yeah, they, you low key fell off. They low key fell off. Yeah. But I mean, even you know the Iraqi incubator baby story. Right, right, thing, right. You know these things are always like, and I mean, it, countless, countless stories uh, are always really trotted out when uh, American rivalry with a country grows in intensity. And I think the Falun Gong really do have their use and their relevance in the modern age because of that. Well, it's funny because you mentioned the NBC, the big NBC report on Epic Times. I mean, it was like the big – it was like a pretty big investigation that they did. Um, and it cited – I mean, there was a, a ton of – pieces in the New York Times and I think a couple actually in the New York Times and the magazine even like looking into kind of the Epic Times and the Falun Gong, how did this get so big, blah, blah, yeah. blah, whatever. Um, it, in the kind of chaos of the 2020 election. Yes. And it made sense, right? Because it the Epic Times is this like, you know, right wing media organization that has like glo that globbed on to the to the Trump campaign, really, and all the anti COVID or anti I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, it, it of seems COVID. actually. I will say they're juicing COVID up more than anybody. Yeah, but so they had all these angles, which then kind of reporting on the like cuckoo nature of this media organization made a lot of sense for the mainstream media in yeah. that moment, right? Um, but we've seen kind of throughout the history of this organization, meaning including the Falun Gong, that at other times their stories are very useful for mm -hmm. the mainstream, like what you're saying. And so it's weird. I could see this sort of like schizophrenic, um, you know, move where suddenly, oh, well, maybe this organ harvesting stuff they're talking about, maybe we should take a second look at it. Or, oh, yeah, they say kind of some kooky right wing stuff, but also they've got the skinny on all of this stuff that's happening. Exactly. In China. And so I, it's going to make us feel insane. Like I'm just yeah. like anticipating it because I feel like you could, you know, th they will have outlived their usefulness in one way and then will become useful in another way. Well, it's funny because you'll see media, some media organizations dismiss like some of the Falun Gong's beliefs with one hand, right? Like, okay, people can't fly. Um, you know, maybe mm. uh, it's okay. It's okay to be a gay person. Sure. Um, but then totally, be like, like fine to marry someone of a different race. Totally, totally. I'll go with me. But uh, but then you'll see on the other hand, they will report uncritically yeah. all of this information that the Falun Gong is laundering. And I got to be honest, it doesn't take you very long to figure out where this information is no, coming from. Uh, we you know? did it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like you can literally <laughs> look at the people who are on these things and where these organizations come from. Yeah. And it's, it's, they don't, I mean, there's only so much you can like do to cover up that trail. And they're not even particularly interested in covering it up, right? No. They review themselves as legitimately religiously persecuted people in China, right? And so like they don't think they need to hide that stuff. 
Um, but I, I will say it's like people take at face value their numbers for some of this stuff. And then like, like, okay, maybe 300 million people didn't die of COVID in China, but like for sure you're being hunted for sport. Yeah. You know? And it's like, it, that doesn't make a lot of sense because it's like, they lie about practically everything. Um, but when it's useful to believe the lie, and this is something that you see so often when it's useful to believe the lie, uh, the lie will be believed yeah, and it will be embraced. I mean, look at the fucking first round of the playoffs. You know what I mean? Exactly. I know people are going to get mad at me, but I want to say one thing. A long you time ago. You already said one thing. I've said lots of things, mm-hmm. but it's also, I co-host this podcast. I'm allowed to. Um, people got really mad at me for correctly calling uh-huh. that the Grizzlies were like little Zoomer baby bitches. Oh, did they? And now, oh, people got really mad at me. Really mad at me. And now everyone is like, man, I can't fucking stand this. They hate the, they complain they hate the Grizzly? all the time. This is such bullshit. I mean, it is bullshit what happened with Jaw. Don't get me wrong. But I won't. no, like his injury, like it's really awful and sad. And I really wish that that didn't happen. And hopefully he can play. But like um, everyone, everyone is like, I can't stand this fucking team. What are they doing? Showboating? They talk too much. They're front runners. Are they showboating? Yeah, they talk too much when they're up and when they're down. They're fucking silent. What do you mean? Like they speak in the media too much? No, it's their attitude. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're too cocky. It's not, but they haven't done anything. Gotcha. It's yeah. unearned. Yeah. And this is like, I mean, even there was just this really funny, like anonymous poll from the athletic. They always do this with, uh, they pull NBA players on like, who's the coach you hate the most? Who's the coach you like the most? Who's whatever. And they all were like, oh my God, we hate the Grizzlies. Really? As an organization. They all hate the Grizzlies. Yeah, because they they are they talk too much. You know, they haven't done anything. I can't I can't really fault them for that. I mean, it's kind of me too. No, you doing. would get it if you if you followed sports. Um, well, I don't follow sports. I follow the teachers of Lee Hongji. And maybe if some of these fucking basketball players did too, they'd find it a little easier to dunk. And I cannot believe we're talking about basketball without talking about what happened. What? I dunked. It's true. I saw it. It's. I want to be clear on this podcast. I dunked. Liz was a witness to it, but I did. I fucking flew in that motherfucking air, and I didn't hang, but I did dunk that ball. We were in the car on the way to from the airport, from the Austin airport, the three of us, and we were talking about how sick dunking is. Yeah. It's so sick. It's so tight. It's still so it's cool. It's so tight. No other sport has a dunk. Do, no. There's no. What's Home that? run is the closest you could get to a dunk. And that's but so, it's so way different. less cool. Yeah, it's so different. It's so different. That's like not even – no. The dunk is about the elevation, the hang, the angle, the, the body, the athleticism. Your, your wiener's in the guy's How face. How high you get up. Yeah. Who you're, who you're dunking on who you're is dunking really on? key. Because people a lot of – oh, I'm dunking. <laughs> Brother, you are appropriating one of the world's greatest – Absolute greatest acts of athleticism. It's incredible. I it's love dunking. It's so fucking cool. And I I can do it. Well, who would have thought that little old dance recital would have led to this, Liz? I would have. Yeah, actually, this is explicitly Yeah, I knew it was going to we be. Like, yeah, yeah, this we was, we're going to do three That's why we went on to the, we went to the show. That is correct. Well... Who would have thought that little dance recital would have led to this, you know? It's crazy because the town I come from actually banned dancing for a long time. Um, And it took me sort of returning to that town and showing them that dancing was actually not only cool but fun and and liberatory for a lot of Mm. teenagers. I mean, I'm, of course, the world's oldest teenager or whatever. Um, I really changed a lot of people's minds. Yeah, And I don't think Shen Yun has that same effect. Well, that's, that's where we met at that camp, right? Yes. At dance camp. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's crazy because, <laughs> you know, ever since I saw Billy Elliot, I've known I could dance. Well, on that note, I'm Liz. My name is the Venerable Baby, the oldest. I'm, I'm the, they call my funky ass the 1,000 year egg. I'm the I'm 1 million year egg. We, of course, have producer Young Chomsky. That's Young pronounced in the Chinese way. And the podcast is called... It's called True and On, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Jeffrey Epstein.
Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs>